Hi everyone, welcome to the chapter nine review for AP Statistics. This chapter was all about significance tests and like chapter eight, it was broken into three sections. The first one was just an introduction to significance tests. The second one focused on proportions and the third one focused on means. So I'm actually gonna create three different videos. Each are gonna be shorter than the last one, obviously. Um, and uh, you would watch all three of them to review for the entirety of chapter nine. But uh, it's just so that the videos are more um, digestible. All right. So what is a significance test? A significance test is basically a test to see whether or not um, your claim is true. And this is usually done through two hypotheses, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, it's usually abbreviated as H and then a zero or H naught. That basically is the hypothesis in which nothing's changed. It's all the same. Usually your scenario is going to be something like, oh, um, the school used to have a 60% uh, pass rate for a certain class. And three years later, they want to see if it's improved because of new uh, textbooks. So they um, test it out. The null hypothesis would say that the proportion, we're going to be talking about proportions in this because 60%. It says it's going to be equal to it. So 60% or 0.6. <clears throat> now, what would the alternative hypothesis be? So that's going to be HA. And that's basically going to be what you um, think will happen, what you suspect will happen. And we just said we want to see if it increases because of the new textbooks. So your alternative hypothesis would be P is greater than 0.6. You could also say, oh, we used a new textbook and we think it's worse, so P is less than 0.6 is going to be our alternative hypothesis. Or you can say, we have no idea what the new textbook did, P is not equal to 0.6. So that's our alternative hypothesis. And um, you can use either one of those three in your um, problems. It, and the procedure is mostly the same. There's a bit of a difference when we get into is not equal to, but I'll get into that a bit later. Now, after a few definitions, um, we need to define what we mean by a one-sided and a two-sided hypothesis. This is what kind of what I was getting at um, with is not equal to. One-sided is basically, it's either above or below. So that's either greater than or less than. And two-sided is, it can be either. So is not equal to is two-sided. And there's a bit of a different procedure we use with two-sided. It's not that different, but it just, um, um, here's a little sneak peek of, uh, why it matters. If this is a population um, a sampling uh, distribution curve, if you have this as your um, uh, one-sided, it can either be above or it can be below the same distance, or it can be two-sided, meaning it's both above and below um, a certain distance. Moving on, um, another important definition is the p-value. <clears throat> So p-value is basically a probability value. And um, the official definition of it is that it's the probability, um, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, the p-value is the probability that um, a certain statistic would be as extreme or more extreme than uh, the one that was observed. So we'll get into interpreting it in a bit. Uh, and that's where I'll actually go uh, deep into what that actually means with an example. Uh, but first of all, we have to interpret something else. What does the null hypothesis mean? And the standard phrasing used for this is, in this setting, the null hypothesis, or H0, says that blank is blank. If H0 is true, then blank. OK, so that's a lot of blanks. Let's get into it. Let's say we're using that same uh, example. H0 is the proportion of students that pass the class is 0.6. Your parameter is going to be uh, you, you don't just write P, you write P and then the parameter in context. So P, the proportion of students passing the class. I can't really write all that on the screen right now. I'm just going to write P, but make sure you have to define what P is. And then the value is 0 0.6. That's what we, um, the null hypothesis is. That's what, if nothing changed, this is, what, uh, this is what the value would be. If the null hypothesis is true, then we say that um, the proportion of students that pass the class is uh, 60%. And now we get to explain what a p-value is. Um, 
we usually say, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, here we would actually write out the null hypothesis, assuming that the proportion of students is 0.6. There is a p-value, you plug in your the p-value that you get, so let's say 0 0.08. There's a 0 0.08 probability of getting, um, same thing here, um, a p-value basically, or a parameter value, sorry, not a p-value. Um, a parameter um, of, and then the sample value is what you get in the sample. So in this case, if we were to say, 0.08, um, and then here I'm just gonna write H naught instead of writing the entire thing up. And the parameter is gonna be your proportion. Uh, the sample value we got, let's say we did a study and uh, we did a sample and we got 0.72, 72% of students passed the class. Or more extreme, just by chance in a random sample of, and then here you describe the sample, a simple random sample of 50 students, for example. Um, so the entire thing would read, assuming that uh, the proportion of students who pass the class is uh, 0 0.6. There's a 0 0.08 probability of getting a proportion of students of 0 0.72 or more extreme. Uh, use, usually you can plug in, instead of more extreme, you can say, or higher or lower, um, just by chance in a random sample of, a simple random sample of uh, 50 students. So that's how you'd use a p-value. We're not going to get into how you calculate a p-value right now. That's uh, for later topics when we talk about actual proportions and means and how to apply it there. But this is basically saying if a problem gives you a p-value, this is how you interpret it, and this is what it basically means. Um, it's very useful for significance tests because it just says that, um, and we'll get into this in a minute or so, but it basically allows you to conclude whether or not um, which hypothesis is true, basically. And there's specific wording for that, too, and I'll get it to. Uh, so how do you actually draw a conclusion? So you have to see if the p-value is small or large. If the p-value is small enough, you say you reject the null hypothesis and that there is convincing evidence for the alternative hypothesis. If, um, if you got a p-value of 0 0.0001, uh, you would say, we conclude that uh, we reject the null hypothesis and there is convincing evidence for the alternative hypothesis. Now, the reason why I chose 0 0.0001 is because it's way too small. There's no uh, confusion whether or not it's small enough. And the small enough is something we need to decide. In the problem itself, it usually will tell you um, what is considered small enough. Uh, we'll get into that soon. If the p-value is large, though, you say you fail to reject the um, null hypothesis. You don't say you accept the null hypothesis. You also don't say you reject the alternative hypothesis. You have to say you fail to reject the null hypothesis, and there's not convincing evidence for the alternative hypothesis. There is evidence for the uh, alternative hypothesis. For example, if the uh, previous proportion was 0.6 and your new proportion was 0.62, uh, your p-value is like 0 0.8 or something, that's not small enough, that's large. So there is not convincing evidence for the alternative hypothesis. There's evidence because it is larger than the uh, null hypothesis value, but it's not convincing enough. And the significance level is basically what tells you if it's um, small or large. Alpha is a symbol. Um, and if P is less than um, or equal to alpha, you basically say it is small enough. If P is greater than alpha, you say it is too large to um, uh, reject the null hypothesis. Uh, and usually it's going to be actually P is less than alpha and P is greater than or equal to alpha because you want to err on the side of the null hypothesis. So if, even if it's equal to the significance level, uh, usually you would ex um, fail to reject the null hypothesis. Uh, it, if they don't give you the significance level, you assume it to be 0 0.05, just like how in a confidence interval, you assume it to be 95% if it's not given. 0.05 is the standard, but it could be less if you want more precision or it could be more if you want you know, more um, or less precision. Um, there are actually two types of errors that could happen when uh, conducting significance tests. The type one error basically says, we actually reject the null hypothesis. The p-value is small enough that we reject it. But in actuality, and we have no way of knowing this, um, the null hypothesis is true. We reject it, but it's actually true. So this is um, the usual um, consequences of this. It, I'll get, get into an example of the two errors later and show you the consequences, for example. But um, 
both types of errors actually have um, drastic consequences, but there's usually one that has more consequences than the other. So sometimes problems will ask you which one is worse. As you might imagine, the second type of error is called the type two error. The type two error basically says, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, the p-value is large, but in actuality, the null hypothesis is not true. Um, we should have rejected it, but we failed to reject it. Okay, what is the probability of getting these two types of errors? The probability of a type one error is alpha, the significance level. Uh, the reason why is because if you reject the null hypothesis, that happens alpha percent of the time. Basically, if you have this curve, it's less than here, uh, 0 0.05, you reject it 0.05% of the time, uh, or 0.05 of the time, 5% of the time, meaning the probability that you reject it and it's um, wrong, since you don't know if it's wrong or not, um, it's going to be that same exact percent. The probability of making a type 2 error is a bit trickier. We'll get into a little bit of um, that in the next section, but we don't know enough to talk about that now. Now let's do an example with the different types of errors. Let's say that you have... Um, Let's go back to the passing the class scenario. If you make a type one error, that means you reject the fact that the proportion of students who pass the class is 60%. Instead, you say it's more than 60%. Our uh, alternative hypothesis, there is convincing evidence for our alternative hypothesis. But in actuality, it is still 60%. The null hypothesis is still true. So what are the consequences of this? Well, you basically overestimate the um, skill level of your student population. A type two error, on the other hand, basically says you fail to reject it. You say it's still 60%, but in actuality, it's more than 60%. There is convincing evidence. There is not convincing evidence for the alternative hypothesis, but the alternative hypothesis is true in the end. What are the consequences of this? Well, you underestimate their performance now. So depending on the situation, either of them could be more severe. Most likely, it'll probably be the type one error that's more severe because you overestimate their um, uh, performance, meaning you basically, usually overestimates are going to be worse than underestimates. Underestimates is like, it's a low bar. And if you do better than that, well, good job. Overestimates, you're basically putting the bar too high. And when you do less than that, uh, you basically um, have a more severe consequence. And that's it uh, for the first video. I know it's very short, but um, I'm making three different videos. So it's not one big one hour long video. So be sure to check out the 9.2 and 9.3 videos that will be out soon as well. Thank you.